A very good morning to you and thank you very much for joining us bright and early this Wednesday morning here at Your Active Debates. We're going to be talking today about animal nutrition and its role in animal health and welfare. Today's event is supported by Fefac and Fefana. And of course, remember, you can join in online by following the hashtag EA Debates. There's also a Q&A function to allow you to ask questions of our eminent panelists who will be happy to take those and we'll try to get through as many as possible in the next hour and a half. Now, animal health and welfare is one of the key dimensions of the European farm to fork strategy. So, of course, we will be talking about that. And it's a pivotal part of the agri-food policy at the heart of the EU Green Deal as well. So, Joining us with a specially recorded video for today's event, we are very pleased to welcome the European Commissioner for Health and Food Safety, Stella Kirakides. So let's have a look now at her video before we go on to the debate. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is privileged to be home to a world-class feed sector. Your organization has earned a reputation for quality and innovation and I am pleased to speak to you today. The dedication and responsibility shown over the recent months to keep our union properly supplied with feed and food should be complemented. Over the past year, you have shown your active commitment to foster sustainability, a commitment we have in common. Our vision is to build resilient food systems built on sustainable principles and competitive growth. Last September, I encouraged your industry to take concrete steps in three important areas. First, we must use resources more efficiently. For example, substitute critical feed materials such as soy from deforested land. Achieving a lower environmental footprint for animal products is highly important for the whole food producing sector. Second, this will lead to collective responsibility for a safer and more sustainable food chain. And third, antibiotics. We focus on antimicrobial resistance in humans, but the reduction in animals is equally important. Let us promote better animal health and nutrition using fewer antibiotics and more innovative feed models. After all, we might be the ones consuming them. This is ambitious and is reflected in our targets in the Farm to Fork strategy, which we adopted nearly a year ago. To be up to the task and build a better world for our children, we must join forces. And we will need your full commitment and contribution, in particular to meet our target of halving both nutrient losses and overall EU sales of antimicrobials for farmed animals and in aquaculture by 2030. Today's focus is on how animal nutrition can improve animal health and welfare. Naturally, enhanced animal nutrition and better husbandry systems improve the health status and welfare of livestock and aquatic species. This has the added benefit of significantly reducing the need for medication with antimicrobials. In the past, supplementation with vitamins, trace elements and probiotics was the leading concept for supporting immunity and improving animal health. But meanwhile, modern feeding regimes focusing on gut health and animals' microbiomes have shown excellent results in strengthening their ability to cope with stress factors as well as with pathogens. We are well aware of the potential benefits that innovations can bring in this field. And this is why, in 2019, we established a new functional feed additive group, which includes new products favorably affecting animals' physiological condition, including their resilience to stress factors. As you will know, animal welfare is very important to me, and additives that can be positively impact on animal welfare can also be authorized in this functional group. Looking ahead, as you know, we are currently undertaking a full review of the feed additive regulation. The benefits of reducing the impact of livestock farming on the environment are a clear priority. Feed additives can play a vital role in enhancing animal welfare and health and can therefore help develop more sustainable livestock farming. 
Ladies and gentlemen, with expertise from the whole feed sector, we can secure a successful transition to a sustainable food system. This will naturally also contribute to our overall health. With this in mind, I'm counting on your constructive support and input for the review of the feed additive regulation. I look forward to our continued cooperation on the many issues on which our joint efforts are both needed to make a lasting impact. Thank you. The European Commissioner Stella Kirakide is there touching on many of the issues that we're going to discuss today from sustainable and resilient food chains to antimicrobial resistance and the role of good nutrition in animal health and welfare. With that, I'm very pleased to welcome our panel of speakers. We have joining us from all around Europe, we have from from Denmark, we have Hanna Larsson, the Chief Veterinary Officer of the Danish Veterinary and Food Administration in the Ministry of Environment and Food. Thank you very much, Hanna. We have Daniela Bataglia, who is a Livestock Production Officer in the Animal and Animal Production and Health Division in the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Antonio Tavares is the chairman of the Pigmeat Working Party within Copa Cogeca. Philip van Immersil is professor at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Ghent. And Benoit Ankatil is the managing director of Cargill Animal Nutrition in Western Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Now, you heard there the commissioner's opening thoughts. As I say, she covered a lot of ground in, in her statement that she recorded especially for us. So well, first of all, let me start with you, Hannah. Give me your opening statement, your opening thoughts, and, and feel free to react to what the Commissioner said. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, I think I can echo the Commissioner in saying that today we have an important topic on the agenda. It's a pleasure to join you to talk about the importance of feed in relation to animal health and welfare. And from a Danish perspective, we're pleased to see the weight put on animal health and welfare in the Commission's Farm to Fork strategy. And to help us achieve the goals, I think we can all benefit from taking a close look into the ambitions in the Feed Sustainability Charter. The ambitious charter represents commitment and transparency. And it highlights many important aspects on how actors in feed production play their part in achieving climate neutral livestock the improving of animal health and welfare. It's obvious, I think, to mention the importance of nutrition solutions to reduce the need for antibiotics and to support animal resilience to stressors, as also mentioned by the commissioner. But I also noticed the charter calling upon all actors in the food chain to work together, to be responsible and trustworthy and to focus on the importance of research and training. We all need to think about innovation, development, and how we are a sector where people would like to work. A colleague of mine told me the other day that AMI is considered to be one of the most important topics that you haven't heard of. The goal of reducing sales of antibiotics and the already established One Health approach is vital in the global fight against AMI. So responsible use of antibiotics is imperative there. And in Denmark, we have had our eyes focused on that for more than 20 years. Feed and innovative feed ingredients is part of the solution regarding AMR and many other aspects in relation to both animal health and welfare. And a few years ago, the Danish government launched a national ingredient strategy to support the ingredient sector in its efforts to bring new solutions to the challenges we are facing, both in the EU and globally, in terms of the transition to a sustainable food system, as also mentioned by the Commissioner. And in this context, we also greatly appreciate the Commission's launch of a refit of the feed editor regulation. The development of the ingredient strategy is one of many good examples, I think, of the cooperation we have in Denmark between national authorities, businesses, research centers, and NGOs. The cooperation brings the resources together to find long-term solutions and has been essential in reducing the, re the use of antibiotics in the farm production, but also virtually in all other aspects of our work to increase animal health, animal welfare, and may I also take the opportunity today to add food safety and sustainability. So I would like to thank you for this invitation to this very relevant. I look forward to 
discuss these issues and to also to be inspired and uh, to yeah, that you can inspire us to take our next steps in our common journey. So thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you, Hannah. I hope uh, we do have an inspiring conversation today. And just to remind our audience that they can use that Q&A function for their thoughts, their comments and the questions to our panel. So, Daniela, let me give the floor to you and hear your opening thoughts, in particular, how, how good nutrition really goes hand in hand in supporting animal health and welfare. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and good morning uh, or afternoon or evening to everybody, depending where people are based. Well, indeed, the current events and challenges, for instance, like even the COVID-19 pandemics or the efforts, as uh, they've been mentioned, to contain antimicrobial resistance, have uh, renewed and strengthened the attention we give to the concept of One Health. And by One Health, I mean the health of uh, the interconnections between the health of human beings, animals, and also the environment in which they live. And this is, a, I think, a golden opportunity to show how animal nutrition has a major impact, not only on animal health, but therefore in turn also to human health and environmental health. And for instance, the most obvious example is through the, the safety of feed, maintaining feed which is safe, feed of contaminant has not only an impact on the health and welfare of the animals, but also in turn to the, to the product of, of animal origin. So therefore on food safety and public health. But the current events have also stressed the importance of prevention and having a preventive approach. So we're now calling for a preventive approach where animal transition together with adequate genetic makeups and the use of animal breeds which are more resistant and resilient to, to diseases, for instance. The good animal husbandry and hygiene, biosecurity, high animal welfare together with animal nutrition can all have an impact on animal health and therefore, as I was saying, on one health as a whole. When we talk about animal nutrition, we talk about adequate diets, with valuable ingredients and additives also, which are free as much as possible from, com from contaminants. We talk about designing tailor-made diets adequate for all species and categories uh, uh, to match the nutritional needs. And uh, we have seen how those diet, diet regimes and those feed ingredients, those feed additives have an, have an impact in improving animal resilience, not only to infection diseases, but also very much to stressors, and therefore also the, the impact not only on animal health, but also on animal welfare. Uh, they've, uh, uh, the, the, the adequate animal nutrition has a huge impact on allowing the gut microbiome to function as a barrier against invading pathogens. And we should not forget the intestinal tissue arbors 60 to 70 percent of all the immune system. So it's it's very important for the animal itself, and I would say also for the for the human beings. Uh, we have also to keep in mind that gut health is much more than a healthy gut, and we should appreciate all the the function that animal nutrition has in the overall physiology and the behavioral needs of the animals. And let me give you just a few examples on how, for instance, the wide range of uh, available feed ingredients and the feed technologies can be used to support host defense generally, but also to control the activities of pathogens, stabilize the microbiota, and support the mucosal barrier function. Uh, for instance, they can also have a pathogen-specific approach. For example, combined feed additive strategies can be used to reduce the risk of salmonella colonization and transmission in broilers. But they, it's also very important in younger animals. Uh, for instance, uh, the various phytochemicals have been uh, demonstrated to have immune stim stimulatory and anti-inflammatory effect in piglets, so very helpful in the winning of the animals, and that could continue giving more and more specific example on how the correct feed ingredients, feed additives, and overall feed regime can help in, uh, in increasing health and welfare of the animals. But I'm very happy that um, the European Commissioner, uh, Stella Kiriakides, has put together the two words, animal health and animal nutrition. Uh, I see that uh, uh, there is uh, 
uh, much more attention and there is much more recognition on the importance of uh, animal nutrition for animals. I don't think it's uh, fully known and fully understand, uh, uh, but I think we can continue to talk about that later during the discussion. For the time being, I'm also very curious to hear about the other participants, or what, uh, what's the point of view, especially the point of view of the private sector. Uh, so far, we've seen a very good example of collaboration between the, the governmental competent authorities and the private sector. So I'm curious to hear about uh, from the others and uh, talk about these points later today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. And we love uh, concrete examples. So very, very much grateful for that. Let me turn now to Antonio. Obviously, at Copa Cojeca, you know about all the requirements. We talk about good hygiene. We talk about best husbandry practices. But obviously, it all goes hand in hand, as I said, with nutrition and the role there, of course, for specialized feed ingredients. Uh, give me your opening thoughts. Um, and in particular, if you've got concrete examples as well, I'd love to hear them, Antonio. Okay, good morning, Jennifer. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, FEFAC and FEFANA for this invitation. It's a big pleasure to be here with you. Of course, I heard uh, the uh, Commissioner Kiriakadis. Uh, yes, uh, we have this challenge of from farm to fork, and this indeed challenge from farm to fork. We have animal welfare and animal wealth in this, uh, in this program. Speaking about animal welfare, of course, we have the highest world standards of animal welfare, but the producers are proud of that. And we want to move on. We want more. I can tell you that uh, our group, uh, the, big set, the big group in Copa Cajeca, have already prepared a long document uh, to propose changes in the Commission to the European legislation on animal welfare to go further than we are. Of course, you can ask uh, how the animal nutrition uh, have a role on this. Yes, I think have an important role because uh, we have three main, main issues on to improve animal welfare. The first one is castration. Of course, it's more and more we are rising in entire males in Europe, uh, but we have always the problem of bourtain. So we are working on genetics to avoid this protein, but also nutrition can have a very important role to avoid this uh, protein. The other aspect, and the most important one, and the bigger challenge for us, is tail docking. So our goal is to ban tail docking. But, of course, uh, to ban tail docking, we have to avoid cannibalism and we avoid to we have to avoid uh, tail biting. Uh, if we have the pigs on the open air, the pigs uh, eat on the ground and eat some worms and some nutrients on the ground, we don't need to cut the, the tail. So that will be fantastic for us if the, the animal nutrition sector can find house uh, a feed that could correct this uh, insufficiency of nutrition we have nowadays on our diet for our pigs to avoid all the cannibalism. Speaking about animal health and the reduction of antibiotics, well, for me, it's quite uh, simple. Uh, we, the producers, we love our animals, but we have our animals to make profit to, to live, to have money to live. So we, we don't want to use antibiotics. We want to reduce as much as possible the antibiotics because antibiotics is an extra cost. You can understand that. So it's not interest for us to use antibiotics. But for do that, of course, we need a very good feed, very good quality feed, because if we have some problems with raw materials in the feed, for instance, mycotoxins or something like that, we can have a gastrointestinal problems and you have to use uh, antibiotics. So we need the best, the better quality for the feed to provide the best healthy, for the best health for, the, for our animals and so uh, to have good herds in good conditions. Thank you, Jennifer. 
Thank you very much. Um, Philip, uh, the floor is now yours. Give us, uh, tell us more about how uh, nutrition supports animal health and welfare. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation again. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here as a member of the scientific community because I'm, I'm a researcher at the university. Um, now, it's quite interesting, of course, what already has been mentioned. And, and here the topic is on uh, the role of animal nutrition in, in, in health and welfare. But, of course, always the link uh, with animal performance uh, should be there if we need to convince the industry to use certain diets and additives and to, to adopt practices, of course. So nutritional solutions for the problems that have been mentioned before by, by the previous uh, members of this panel um, should, should support gut health and resilience to stresses, of course, and this is highly depending on the response of the, of the host to the gut microflora. So this is, these two components are, are very important, of course, uh, and both the microflora and the host can affect health, of course, and the host response as well. So um, this, this interaction between, between the bacteria present um, in the gut and, and the host responses should be studied very well. And this is only possible, I think, if we, as scientists, interact with the industry, listen to their questions, of course, and try to give or provide solutions together, huh? also together with people from regulatory authorities. So this uh, interaction is very important. Now, one big issue, I think, is that we um, still rely on animal performance as an indicator of, of health in general. Huh? Um, and to my opinion, there, there's a very clear and urgent need for easy, reliable and fast um, tools, diagnostic tools to evaluate the response to nutritional interventions that support gut health. Eh? So that integrations or companies that produce diets and additives can evaluate uh, products and diets that they are developing or using. So I think that's very important. And it's important to mention that it's gut health, it's not always about pathogens and, and, and mostly it's just some kind of, of problem with digestibility, with intestinal inflammation, with dysbiosis, and often this is related to, um, to fast growth of the animals. So it's, it's a very complex uh, problem very often huh? that of course also can create uh, animal welfare issues. So um, I think for these diagnostic measures or these evaluation tools, we need criteria and, and, and method development is not a bottleneck, but really deciphering which criteria or parameters associate with health and welfare uh, that are driven by diet. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done in, in that regard. So on the question here on, on how the EU or, or, or governments can stimulate and support innovation in animal nutrition, to successfully address societal demands for sustainable animal products and animal welfare, I think one of the innovations is on evaluation methods uh, for dietary interventions or dietary changes so that we open this black box uh, and there can be a clear discrimination between, on the one hand, reliable tools and reliable uh, diet changes and additives, and on the other hand, tools that do not add a lot to any solution in health and welfare promotion. So here, I think we need a lot of multidisciplinary research on, on, on the relation between diet, host, and microbes in relation to stressors. And a final comment is maybe that, well, um, also in terms of, of um, um, alternative feed ingredients, that's probably very important when we think about sustainability. So I think we also need to come up with diets that contain some alternative feed sources or components so that also locally feed materials can be used. Eh? We definitely need also to develop solutions for this so that we uh, promote sustainability. So, and also here, tools to diagnose gut health and predict performance are, of course, at, at, at great importance. And maybe a final remark also here, as a scientist, I'm very intrigued by um, by, by the, the animal welfare and animal behavior topic, because I'm quite confident that also we can steer the microflora in the gut using diets and dietary additives so that these bacteria produce metabolites that are captured by the brain of the animal and also steers behavior and welfare. So this is my final uh, comment. So thank you. 
Thank you, Philip, uh, opening up a whole new area there for us as well this morning. But I'm glad you also mentioned animal performance, because as I say, the title of today is, is Health and Welfare, but I think probably we should bring performance into that as well. Now, Benoit, I noticed you nodding along with a lot of what Philip was saying. Uh, give us your opening thoughts as well. Hello, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, of this panel. A, a lot has been uh, has been said already, but I I would like to highlight uh, three main points. The first one is regarding our industry, feed and uh, specialty feed. We are fully committed to 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 support uh, and to provide innovation in uh, feeding strategy, in additive, in order to. Uh, to meet the demand of the consumer regarding animal health and animal welfare. That's a key point. And uh, we, we, we are part of this journey and we want to, to, to lead, uh, to lead that, that topic also. So the second point I want to highlight is that I think that in the EU, and it was mentioned by Antonio, I think that we, have, we are developing a competitive advantage on that topic meaning that we continue to invest a lot in uh, research and innovation regarding animal science in private and in public sectors. And those topics of animal health and animal welfare are more and more uh, on those demand and on uh, research and innovation. So that's, that's key. Uh, if we continue to invest, if we continue to develop those topics, we will have a leading position. Uh, and as we did 18 years ago with antibiotic growth promoters that we ban, we will be able to find innovation, uh, which will uh, make a lot of sense for uh, the industry, but also for the consumer. So that's a, a very important point. Let's make sure that EU uh, is leader on that topics. The third point I want to mention is that for Cargill, sustainability is key. Our purpose being to nourish the world in a safe, responsible and sustainable way. Our industry and uh, Cargill, we start more than 50 years ago on those topics by adding uh, simple vitamins and trace elements to nutrients in, in order to, to fill some deficiency. We are doing more and more innovation on those topics. Today, we are able to, to work on antioxidant status uh, with uh, botanicals. We are working on uh, microbiome. I think that Philippe is, uh, is a real expert on that topic. We are working on microbiome in order to, to link microbiome and gut health with the new methods, which are uh, really promising. A last example we, is about digital. We are investing in digital solution in order to be able to capture information live in farm and to provide information for the farmer to be able to take preventive action rather than curative action. I am sure that we will be able to exchange more on those topics in the coming minutes. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you. I think we've covered a lot of ground already, uh, just setting out the stall in the first half hour for the importance of this topic for our discussion. Um, I also see from the audience, thank you, some questions coming in already. Let me remind you, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function for questions from our panellists. And if they are directed to a specific panellist, please do note that in your question. But before we get on to that, I do want to do an, another round, uh, a tour de table, as it were, with each of you again focusing a bit more this time on EU policy because uh, alongside we have the, the farm to fork strategy but the Commission is revising the feed additives regulation and also the other, other elements of revisions of legislation for animal welfare through uh, regulation. So I would like to know from each of you what are your expectations regarding this and, and whether you think the EU policy making process is actually recognising enough the importance of animal nutrition and innovation with in that. Uh, so again, Hannah, let me, me begin with you. What, what do you think is, is going on and, and, and are you satisfied with it? I can't hear Hannah. Sorry, I think you can hear me now, can't you? I can hear you now, yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, as I already said, we were pleased with the, uh, the farm to, to fork strategy and, and the weight on, on animal welfare and and the uh, animal health in it. Uh, but I also noticed uh, or, or talked a little bit about the refit of the feed additive regulation. And, and in there, I think we have some, some as, as we consider important issues about uh, the, uh, the, the approval of the, the new uh, functional um, 
uh, things in, in, in the feed and, and how we regulate the additives there. Uh, and, and to us, it, it would be a high priority to, to, uh, to what can I say, uh, talk to the Commission about how the, the lengthy of the approval of uh, feed additives and, and the, the, the complex um, uh, approval of feed additives, how, what, what can we do about that and how can we make it easier for especially uh, uh, small uh, companies and, and medium companies to 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 bring their additives uh, to the market. Uh, I'm well aware that that this has also problems because, of course, you need to be uh, able to to document the effect on on the feed additives. But but at the moment, we we think we we simply need to to look closer into how how can we uh, make it more easy for for the the feed companies to to go to this uh, process and bring uh, new solutions uh, to the market. So so this is one of the the places or one of the areas where we will uh, highlight the 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 things that, uh, the current uh, discussions in the in the EU. Uh, recognizing that we are very pleased that the Commission has opened both the refit of the feed uh, regulation additives and also uh, on on the uh, farm to fork strategy where I'm I'm very pleased to hear about uh, my my colleagues here in the parallel uh, we should be very ambitious both towards uh, the AMR which I mentioned a lot in my opening but also very ambitious on animal a welfare where I think we have the lead in the EU and we need to remain that lead. So I think that'll be my um, answer for the moment and probably we'll come back to some of it. Uh, we will indeed. Benoit, let me, let me skip over to you and get your thoughts on the current EU policy making uh, you know, approach and do you think it's the right one? First of all, if we uh, starting with the additive regulation, uh, um, I, I think that the, we we are in full support of the revision. That's the first point. What we what we need is uh, clear rules, uniform rules. That's very very basic. But at the same time, we want to, we would like to have two things. One is more clarity on claims, what we can claim, what we cannot claim, and uh, to have a strict, uh, let's say, uh, definition uh, on, on that. Uh, the second point uh, it was mentioned before. Let's make sure that we have uh, a faster, a quicker process in order to provide innovation to the market. Uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of in innovation of the pipeline, but today, we have to say that the process is pretty long, uh, and uh, and we we would like to make sure that this process is uh, uh, will be will be accelerated uh, in order to provide uh, a clear solution which will uh, provide benefits to the farmer and to the industry. That's a, that's a second very important point. Uh, regarding animal welfare, I think it was mentioned already before. Uh, we would like also to go for uniform claim, uniform rules, and at the same time to have clear KPIs because it's how to define animal welfare in a uh, clear and uh, intelligent way, smart way, is something which is not so easy. So having clear KPI will, will be something which will help us. Thank you. Uh, Philip, I noticed you were nodding. I mean, do you think these uh, key performance indicators that Ben was mentioning are, are, are included sufficiently in EU policymaking, in EU legislation, and I guess in benchmarking and enforcement eventually? Well, I, uh, yeah, as a scientist, I do not know exactly the, the details of all the regulations, of course, but what I heard and what Benoit is saying is, is, is the, uh, about the claims, and I think that's mm -hmm. a very important issue, the claims and how to measure these claims, can, because there's a variety. I mean, that there's a huge number of additives on the market, for example, of which some of them might have even the same uh, type of, of product in it, for example, probiotics or whatever, but they all have different... Um, let's say, uh, modes of action, they all have, have different um, aspects they target. So it's very, very difficult uh, when you have such a variety of products on the market. I mean, um, I think here also, if you want to make a proper regulation in, in, in well, revising uh, the previous one, 
um, you really need criteria, and that's, I think, uh, I will emphasize this a few times. Uh, if you don't have good criteria, it will be very tricky, and, and I guess um, improving performance could be a criterion, reducing antimicrobial use, et cetera, et cetera, but that could also be very much more specific. Huh? Um, criteria could as well be a proven anti-inflammatory activity, et cetera. So for me, that's, of course, apart from the, the safety and, and, and the stories about, about the speed of, of uh, registering, et cetera, I think these criteria that needs to be set um, are very, very crucial here. Thank you. Antonio, your thoughts on whether there's enough emphasis on nutrition within policymaking at EU level? Uh, well, of course, I'm a big producer, so I'm not a scientist. So to speak about uh, the feed additive regulation, it's not easy for me. But I want to say something. For us, uh, we what we uh, want is to have a feed additive regulation based on scientific opinions and not on political opinions or in economical opinions. And uh, why I, I say that? Uh, I give the example of the zinc, the zinc oxide. The zinc oxide was banned because to avoid contamination of the soils. Okay, when we see the map of Europe, we see the bigger contamination of zinc oxide is in the north of Sweden, where there are no pigs at all. And in the, the two main uh, producers, uh, production regions, which are in Catalonia, in Spain, and Brittany, in France, we have very low levels of zinc oxide in the soil. So, look, uh, I don't see the scientific uh, ear opinion. This is a political decision to, to have votes on the elections. So, that's what we don't want. We want everything based on science and not on political decision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Danielle, and I, I left you to last because I want you, in fact, to tell us more about the, the FAO policymaking side of things rather than EU level. So uh, is it different or, or, is there, or is there an alignment? Well, uh, we are a UN organization, so of course we, we work with all our members, uh, which are over uh, 192, and, and the European Union is one of our members, but we don't work only with, with the region. And overall, uh, see, just uh, to, to give a little bit of a generic comment to, to what I'm, I'm hearing, I'm very happy to see that within the European Union, to see the role of animal nutrition much more much more recognized maybe than before, to see as also from the, the words of the, the European Commissioner, to see the role in animal health and production recognized and fully addressed. But overall at global level in the, uh, many countries, I would like to, to see much more of um, interdisciplinary work together. The competent authorities, the regulators, not only addressing the animal nutrition, but animal health and welfare, antimicrobial resistance, really working together and understanding the connection between the different sectors. I don't think overall in many countries that is happening. A, a lot of information exchange on what are the innovation or what the, the, the sector is doing and what can be used in uh, for, for our our um, objective, for instance, of uh, reducing antimicrobial resistance is still not very well known, perceived, and, and, and used. So having those kind of uh, collaboration within the different uh, regulatory framework uh, going hand in hand, I think it would be very much useful and, and recognize recon the, the much bigger recognition of the, the value of animal nutrition in these big challenges ahead of us. Thank you. Well, Hannah, let me ask you, since we're, since we're talking about different countries, about member state preparedness um, on the deployment of the current EU strategies. I mean, what, in your opinion, are the major obstacles at as you know, at national level in the implementation of these policies, because we see a lot of big aspirational goals. We see uh, the, the, you know, reducing the EU sale of antimicrobials for farmed animals by 50% by 2030, which isn't really that very much far away. So what do you think is, is, uh, is the big issue at national level? I mean, obviously you're speaking for Denmark, but... Uh 
Uh, yeah, I'm speaking for yeah, I'm speaking for Denmark, of course. But 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 it it is it is an issue for us to be prepared, uh, and it is an issue for us to work as an authority and to to what I hear from one of my my other colleagues. We need to balance the the scientific opinion, but also the political opinion. When when we uh, go and and influence uh, the EU uh, regulation, so so to be prepared to to uh, to make sure that we have heard the industry, that we have heard the NGOs, that we have heard the the, the farmers, and all on, on that. And what is the the biggest issue for us? What is the the biggest uh, challenges uh, that we have at the moment? And what should then be our priority in uh, influencing the uh, the EU regulation? So we have worked uh, on that in many years in Denmark. How to uh, exactly, as we heard from FAO, um, have this interdisciplinary uh, work together on how to to make sure that we come up and have our priorities straight. And these priorities, they have the beginning in the industry, in the NGOs, in the in the public opinion, uh, and then to make sure that we know what is most important for us. But uh, in Denmark, it has been a goal for many years to be ambitious um, regarding antibiotics and animal welfare and the reduction of antibiotics. So that will be one of one of our major uh, things to to come forward with, and how to uh, apply with the, the the goals that we have in the EU uh, about uh, the reduction of the use of antibiotics. Because we have been there for for many years and worked with it for many years, and and of course we have a reduction already, uh, which is need to to we need to take in account when when we uh, talk about it. So. So uh, it's just to, to make sure that you have, have balanced all the interests that you represent. I think it's one of the important things. And then try to influence the EU in being very ambitious in our long-term strategies uh, to, to highlight always and always be, have in mind uh, the reduction of antibiotics and the animal welfare. And I'm very... Um, pleased to, to participate today because I'm, I'm one of the persons who think that we might have overlooked uh, the feet and the feet uh, importance in this uh, uh, dialogue and in this discussion is, is something that I think we need to be very aware of in Denmark as well. Uh, well, Benoit, let me let me put that to you. Um, do you think the contribution of the feed sector is being sufficiently sought, is being sufficiently in included? But, uh, first of all, if, if it's not, we also have to we have also to to communicate and to and to show what we are doing. So that's uh, that's an important topic. If we take the the last example uh, shared by uh, by Anna uh, regarding antibiotics. The last figure I have, it's from 2011 to 2018. The use of antibiotics in Europe has been reduced by 35%. I do not have the last figures, but uh, we, we, we have to recognize that first point. And if we think about antibiotics via premix or via feed, more or less directly, uh, it's even more because uh, the reduction is 51%. So uh, a, a, lot have, a lot has been done. Uh, and Coming back to, to the example provided on zinc oxide, that's a very good discussion. Uh, uh, we know that zinc oxide is efficient and it's uh, uh, it's uh, cheap, but at the same time, it has some issue. By, uh, let's say, having this reduction in zinc oxide, it push also the industry. It's a challenge, but at the same time, it's an opportunity in order to push innovation and to find solution. Early nutrition, very early nutrition with liquid milk for piglets, uh, and, and plenty of, of other solutions regarding balance of amino acid, uh, uh, preparing the gut health, preparing the, the microbiome is something which will be beneficial in all cases. So we have challenges. Let's make sure that we transform those challenges in opportunity for the industry to develop things which are well accepted, which are safe, and which provide also performance and at the end benefits for, for the farmers. 
Thank you. Well, you've raised an issue that I was going to ask Philip about anyway, which is with regard to uh, communication from stakeholders and scientific knowledge. And I'm asking really whether are we communicating enough? Is there uh, scientific evidence being supported and picked up in a timely manner by, you know, by the public, by policymakers? Is there more that uh, the sector could be doing to communicate the benefits? Oh, I think we do quite a lot. I think with something that is clearly has been changed, I think the last uh, 10 to 15 years is that scientists and universities and research institutes collaborate really a lot with the industry. I think this is something that really changed a lot. Uh, when I started 25 years ago, this was completely not the case, but, but I mean, in the meanwhile, um, I think for a lot of, of groups working on, on, on animal production and animal gut health, about 50% of their projects are together with, with industrial collaborators. So I think that's uh, something that changed a lot and also probably led to a lot of, of innovation and breakthroughs as well, eh? this kind of collaboration. So it's really crucial. Um, about communication, well, the, the difficulty, of course, always a little bit with scientists is that they want to publish in, in scientific journals that are not reaching uh, the audience that probably need to be reached when you want to really change things in, in, in the field. That's, that's, that's definitely true. Um, but I think also in the meanwhile, there's a lot of communication done in, 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 in well, let's say, in animal production magazines, in poultry magazines, in calf magazines, in, 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 in pig magazines by um, scientists together with the industry. So I think this is something that, that is really uh, try to be done in big projects. Also, the communication aspect is always included, even in different work packages. So I think it's it's more or less in. And of course, it's also also easy to to do that now using a variety of of, of uh, channels on the internet. So I think we do that quite a lot, and also the industry is doing that quite a lot. Thank you, Antonio. Speaking from from the EU livestock sector, the farmers' perspective. Uh, do you think there's been a lot of progress made in the understanding of innovative feeding strategies? Because we often don't think about this as necessarily a, a high-tech innovative industry, but there is a lot of innovation out there, is there not? Uh, yes, I think uh, we, we, we have a lot of innovation. For instance, Benoit uh, talked about uh, zinc oxide and the replacement for zinc oxide. Of course, in the beginning, we have used more antibiotics when they banned the zinc oxide. But in this moment, the innovation on the feed uh, additives, I think, have compensated uh, this situation. But uh, also, as, uh, as Benoit said, we have already reduced a lot the, uh, the antibiotics in our production. The problem is, and you spoke about communication. The problem is communication. We can, we have uh, huge difficulties to communicate with the consumer and explain how we are producing, what we are doing in improving animal welfare, in reducing and uh, the use of antibiotics. And I give you a concrete example. Last year, the pork sector have launched a campaign in Europe. Was called "Let's Talk About Pork." This was a campaign launching France, Spain, and Portugal. And what we wanted with this campaign is not to say that the pork is the best meat. Of course, it's the best meat in the world. But we don't want to say that pork is fantastic, it's the best meat, you have to eat more pork. What we, we wanted in that campaign was to discuss how we produce our animals and what are we doing with our animals. And what was the first reaction we had? was from Euroactive with an article to the Commission asking the Commission to stop immediately the campaign because we, we are criminals, we, we don't take care of our animals, we use a lot of antibiotics and blah, 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 blah. And after, I wanted to answer that and Euroactive to tell me, no, look, you have, uh, you have written a very short article we cannot publish that. Okay, I'm not a writer, I'm a producer, so I only write what I think and short this lot. Let's to see. We need much more communication because the feed uh, sector is doing a good job, we are doing a good job, and we have to communicate it to the consumer because if we don't do that, 
it's not used to to <laughs> to make more research or to to work much more. I'm sorry to to say yes. that we are lucky because you are the host, but <laughs> I'm well, sorry, I, but it's the reality. <laughs> I think Antonio, I think it's fair to say that no one here thinks you're a criminal at all, uh, and, and I think you're referring to an opinion piece, which you know we do highlight are very much opinion pieces, and we do try to give everyone the right of reply. Uh, you certainly had it this morning, um, but. Daniela, let me bring you in on uh, on this question about communication. Um, is this a, a, a global phenomenon? Is this something we see at, at, at different levels in different countries that consumers or policymakers aren't aware enough of innovative new uh, new technologies in the feed sector? Well, unfortunately, yes, it's a global phenomenon. It's not only in the European Union, and that's something we are struggling for and we're trying to address. That's why, for instance, we have meeting constantly, at least one, once a year or more, to put together within the feed sector, the regulators, so together with the feed industry, to exchange information, to let to know each other what is going on. It's important to have, as it has been said before, um, a legislative environment which is uh, positive for the development of uh, innovation, uh, new feed regimes and new uh, feed ingredients or new feed practices. And it's important for the regulators to know what the industry, for instance, can can make available. It's important also for the consumers, I would say, citizen as a whole, to, to, to hear about what is going on in the sector. And that's one of our major efforts. We really want to, to make sure that the different specialists, the different professionals are aware about that. And I would like to, to recall also to what Anne was saying at the beginning, and that's also oh, one of my personal concerns, uh, talking with animal welfare specialists and uh, making them available of the importance of animal nutrition. Far too often I see a transport address and the, the, the housing of animals, the slaughter practices, all very important issues. But very little attention, for instance, is given to animal nutrition, how animal nutrition should be addressed for the welfare of the animals and what also the, the sector can, can, um, can offer. So that's where our efforts are going in really trying to spread the information and the knowledge as much as possible and having the different uh, uh, actors talking with each other the academia, the research centers together with the private sectors and the competent authorities, the governmental authorities, but also, for instance, the financial institution and the media. Uh, maybe we're a better place than others because we can play that kind of impartial role in calling all the actors together and having that exchange of information, and we try to use it as much as possible. Um, and another topic, for instance, we are we are starting working more, especially in the framework of uh, the containment of uh, antimicrobial resistance is uh, behavioral changes and how to address, especially at farmer levels, uh, their behavior in order for them to, to, to make better use of what is available and what, for instance, the animal nutrition uh, uh, sector is providing. A lot of, I don't think a lot has been done there, but I think uh, that's a big uh, uh, opportunity to, to make farmers and producers more aware of what uh, what is available and what can be used from, from their side to address some of the current challenges. Over. Thank you. Um, Hannah, now um, I know you've got this uh, action plan against antimicrobial resistance and, and you've got a toolbox, toolbox rather, of, of, of uh, tools as it were, at your disposal. Um, is, an, is nutritional solutions one of those? And how do you encourage that uptake by farmers? I guess it's a, it's a communication in a different way. Uh, may, may I just add one thing before I answer that? Because uh, I would also like to, to reflect a bit upon, upon the communication side that, that uh, the other panelists have, have talked about. Because we, we have already uh, said a lot about the cooperation and the need for working together and especially also uh, taking the research into account because we need more knowledge about effect and the technology to, to be aware of uh, how to influence uh, the, the new uh, legislation. But uh, I think that there might be a tendency to look at the uh, administration or the authorities 
as uh, the um, the administration who ensures uh, compliance with regulation and and who uh, ensures compliance through uh, inspections uh, and perhaps guidance but but i would also like uh, to 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 say that or to stress that uh, the authorities we, we can also help in the communication uh, and there is, uh, at least I hope, a certain level of professionalism in the administration that can help ensure credibility um, in, the, in the communication. So I think uh, when I talk about uh, working together with, uh, about research and uh, a lot of other things, I think we could also work together uh, in, in level of uh, communication. Uh, so I was just wanted to say that because I think it's it's a good thing to remember that we can add a certain credibility to to that communication and we have a lot of evident evidence based knowledge uh, in the area that that we could also uh, come up with. Um, so uh, about the uh, antibiotics and the uh, the work tool that we have, yes, yes, we have a lot. Uh, and uh, I think that we have um, some of the things as well that, that are very related to feed. Uh, in Denmark, we have this great toolbox that you have uh, mentioned, Jennifer, but we also have a political agreement that we renew every four years. And, and that is a lot about uh, the reduction of antibiotics and, as well. And in this agreement, we focus a lot about research. And the latest uh, four years, we have had, um, I think, quite many uh, projects uh, in our research centers, in our universities, focusing uh, a great deal about feed and how we can use um, feeding strategies and management strategies to uh, help us in the weaning period where we uh, use uh, the most of our antibiotics and to reduce that. So to be more specific, we have projects about uh, umbilical cord inflammation, about feed strategies in the weaning period and so on. And this is our universities that are working with that at the moment uh, and including a lot of uh, feed strategy in that. So I'm sorry to say that I don't have the results yet, but the, because they're not supposed to be finished until the end of this year or the beginning of the next year. But in our overall research program, we have uh, thought a lot about how feet can be uh, perhaps, uh, if I may say, the, the next most important thing in how we reduce antibiotics. Uh, and when I have the work, may I just uh, add one more thing because uh, we now uh, said, and you, you also asked about the incentive to use this uh, feed and this uh, new uh, innovative feed. And I think that's one of our challenges. That is how to make the farmers, perhaps small, medium-sized farmers, to, to give them the incentive to use this innovative feed products. I'm not sure that, that we have the, the answer for that. And that would be um, an interesting thing to discuss as well. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Now, um, I see we've got almost 300 viewers and there's questions coming in. So I'll try and deal with a couple of them. I think, Philip and Benoit, this one is a little bit provocative, but might be useful for both of you. Uh, Philip Becker is asking, considering feed additives are only one part of the diet and nutrition is part of this overall uh, nutrition solution, what is the value of evaluating the efficacy of feed additive as a standalone? Uh, Philip, do you, want to, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, of course, I com completely agree that you have to look, well, if you use a feed additive, even the, the action of the activity can differ when you start using that in different diets. For example, when you would, thinking about poultry, use a wheat-based diet or a corn-based diet, you use different nitrogen uh, sources, whatever, it can differ. But actually for feed additives, for evaluating the action of feed additives, it's just important that you, well, if you do that, if you, that you, well, really focus on a specific, um, problem or syndrome or disease or pathogen, whatever. I mean, you should link the activity with any feed additive with a certain outcome. And 
ideally, this is independent uh, from the diets or the diet composition and, and itself. So just as an example, you have some compounds, uh, for example, probiotic strains that produce, uh, let's say, lipopeptides or bacteriocins with antimicrobial activity against Clostridium or E. coli. That's evident and that works in any diet. So that's a clear um, aspect, a clear criterion and a clear claim, I think. For others, it might be much more uh, difficult. Huh? Um, but I think it's it's still useful to do that for, for each um, individual additive independent of diets. Huh? Of course, this is something that needs to be studied. And one of the uh, final outcomes could be that, that, that you claim a certain um, health aspect uh, that is, is provided by a certain feed additive in a certain type of diet. That could as well be, yeah? but this is, of course, that needs to be tested. Benoit, let me, let me put the same question to you. It's a provocative one, but possibly one that needs answering. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, one thing which uh, needs to be known is that in, in the registration process of additive, which is very formal, you have several trials to perform in order to, to sustain your claim. And usually you have to use uh, those uh, additive in different type of diet, but also in different type of uh, uh, animal farm conditions. So that's, uh, that, that's something which is uh, not perfect, but uh, covered uh, co covered in the registration process. We 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 have to uh, test the additive in different conditions uh, in order to to get the registration. So I think that's a, that's the first answer to to to, to say uh, regarding additive also. It's part of the solution uh, in order, for example, to reduce antibiotics, but it's, we know that it's not a magic, a magic stick. Uh, uh, it's about, yes, additive, but it's about uh, perfect uh, nutrition uh, equilibrium. It's about farm management. It's about uh, uh, competency of uh, all the chain around. It's about hygiene. So. Uh, for sure, uh, additive will be part of the solution and will help to solve the solution, but it's part of a complete, let's say, offer, a complete program, which is much broader. Uh, and Benoit, let me ask a follow-up question. We've got one here from Stefan Ailes, who's saying improved animal health and welfare through alternative innovative ingredients comes at a cost. So can you talk a bit about the value chain? That's a, uh, that's a very good question regarding animal welfare because we, uh, th that's a very valid question in aquaculture and in an, our, uh, all, uh, our industry. A good example is that we are uh, uh, using more and more, for example, in aqua uh, uh, protein from, uh, from insects, but uh, uh, the, cost, uh, the cost usually increase. So we need to be able to capture the value at, at, at the end of the, sh of the chain. That's very simple. I, I don't know if you, you you know this system of star for uh, poultry production in the Netherlands. Huh? We have uh, one, two, three stars in order to evaluate, uh, uh, let's say, the an animal welfare situation of broiler. Cost, cost of production of one star compared to conventional is between 40 and 50 percent higher. Cost of production of organic is 195 percent higher. So we have to have that also in mind. So that's uh, animal welfare is a plus for sure, but it has a cost related and we need to make sure that at the end, uh, the chain has a benefit uh, to, to, to do that uh, and, and especially our farmer uh, customer. Thank you. Um, I know we have another, just a comment here from Katarina Labau who says, they are working in the communication in the feed sector. And one big issue is the difficulty in having accurate data about the achievements of the sector in a way that the general public can understand. Is the sector working to communicate with a public that is not expert in the area? I think we've probably covered a lot of that already in our discussion. Uh, Daniela, we have a very specific question uh, for you, directed at you, coming in from Jan Varten, saying, do you think the One Health concept, which we haven't really gotten into yet, uh, is sufficiently considered in the development of new tech tools? Well, thank you, Jan. I think it's very good and maybe provocative questions. Uh, no, I don't think it is. And that I think, again, going to communication, we need to do a lot of efforts to make sure that animal nutrition is very well recognized as an important, I would say, as a key element in one health. As, as we have all said, 
uh, the, 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 we have showed the importance of animal nutrition, not only for animal health, but also for internal, especially when we talk about zoonosis, where we talk about food safety, for human health, and also for environmental health, through the impact that the feed can have in the, 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 the environmental footprint. So yes, we do have to work all together to make sure that animal nutrition is well recognized and uh, all efforts are, 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 are done to, to take that into account. And exactly the, the innovations in, in One Health will also include the innovation in animal nutrition. I don't know if uh, I'm specifically replying to your question, but I think that that's, yes, it is something that to, to, be, to be stressed even further. Thank you. Um, we let's see if uh, we have uh, also uh, some some other questions uh, to Antonio. Uh, Jackie Mills is asking, how is the industry readying itself for the ban on group preventative use of antibiotics, including in feed? Well, let's see. Of course, uh, what Benoit said uh, has absolutely right. Uh, we have to reduce the use of antibiotics. We want to do that for sure. Uh, but of course, it's a multifactorial issue. We have also the management of the of the herd. We have the genetic. We have all, a lot of factors that we are working on that. But of course, the the feed uh, additives uh, have an important role to control this situation, to have the healthy animals, and to provide, uh, of course, uh, healthy pigs so less antibiotics. Of course, there is always a question of cost. The economic point of view, it's all important because, of course, if you, if you need innovation, we have more costs. And uh, But uh, you understand me. If, if maybe, uh, we have a, a problem is that sometimes when we improve animal welfare, when we make a lot of improvement, we, we improve the cost of production and the consumer is uh, not very does not want to accept very well that but we we are aware that we need to do that we need to support these extra costs if there is an extra cost because we absolutely uh, have uh, to to have the consumer with us and so we have to please the consumer and the consumer absolutely wants to have less and less antibiotics uh, in our production. I don't know if I uh, answered the question. <laughs> Uh, thank, well, thank you. I mean, there's just a lot, as I say, coming in, some very specific, some very general. Um, Hannah, uh, a very specific question to you. Uh, just a, a, a viewer asking, is your toolbox on the website so they can have a look at it? Can you direct people to, to where they can find more information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have a lot of information on our website, on the toolbox. I, I can just briefly say here that it, uh, it covers a lot about monitoring. Uh, it covers a lot about setting targets uh, for at least for a four year period on how much we should reduce the use of antibiotics. But also we have had the yellow card scheme for many years uh, where, where we um, put sanctions on, on the farmers that have uh, high levels of use of antibiotics about the the levels that we have set but i was all oh i would also like to to stress that we have some new incentives that we we have started uh, about using supervision and controls of the uh, veterinary protection and also at farm level so so it uh, it goes uh, uh, in many ways monitoring and but also guidance and also that we try to 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 be hard on the the persons or the farmers that that use the most so but but you can find it on our websites and we have an english website as well yeah Thank you. Uh, very useful. Um, and I know there's lots of questions that are just more uh, specific advice based. So thank you to our audience members for those. But I do encourage you to go and have a look online for, for some of the, the, the comments there that are made by Hannah as well as our other guests. Um, 
Daniela, one for you. How does FIO support the farming and connected value chains to promote animal nutritional strategies at farm level? Um, what is the role of the FAO dietary toolbox for farm holdings? Well, we normally have several activities, especially addressing capacity de development. So just uh, communicating to farmers, but also helping them through training, for instance, uh, in uh, getting better knowledge or, or being more able to apply the, the available practices or the available uh, tools we have available. So, uh, for instance, uh, we do publication. We have a recent one that address specifically feed safety as uh, and the, the best practices to be done in the feed sectors to ensure feed safety. As it has been mentioned, that's an important element also on uh, how animal nutrition can contribute to, to animal health and welfare. And uh, we're now going out in the in the coming months with another a new publication on exactly the, the dietary uh, tools and strategies uh, to uh, the, that animal nutrition has uh, to for instance uh, allow the to decrease the use of antimicrobials in animal production. So we do spread those, that information through publication, but we also try to make farmers and the all operators, not only farmers, available on those through nowadays webinars, otherwise meetings and so on. And then we have specific training activities, again, to make farmers and the operators available and to implement those practices that we are aware of. Again, we we work very much in collaboration, not only with the regulators and competent authorities, which are uh, traditionally our counterpart in governments, but also more and more with the feed industry. And uh, as uh, the, the example, for instance, uh, of me uh, the, being here in this event is, is uh, a proof of that, but we have also uh, overall uh, uh, collaboration with the International Feed Industry Federation, of which FEFA and FEFA are part, and we have a whole range of activities together. So again, it's mainly through capacity building, making farmers and all operators aware of what is available and enabling them to apply those, uh, those, that knowledge through uh, adequate practices, for instance. <laughs> Thank you. And, and we're very glad to have you here as well, Daniela. And uh, I should remind our audience that if you missed the beginning of our discussion this morning, for whatever reason, uh, you can, of course, it will be videoed and it will be available for you to look back at and, and get the knowledge as well. Uh, Philip, we have a question uh, to you again from Jacqueline asking, what are your thoughts on the use of human waste streams for animal feed in terms of nutrition and biosecurity? Ooh, this is a, this is a difficult question <laughs> for me. Uh, um, I I would say okay, Antonio, that it's, it's we will <laughs> not okay. You no, know, um, because I mean I have just one case in the past that uh, this was this was for cattle in uh, which a human waste stream has been used as part of some feeding strategies, and we saw a lot of problems there with um, well with just um, an, an, an infectious microorganism that came through the animals and, and led to a lot of, of issues there with, with meat quality. So I wouldn't really, I mean, I don't think it's, it's a, well, it, it's a very good idea also not on the digestibility, for example, of these, uh, uh, of, of these uh, ingredients, et cetera. So I wouldn't really consider it as, as the best idea. I think there's much more quality to be delivered uh, with what we currently do in, in terms of animal nutrition. But I think this is much more a question for Benoit and Antonio, I guess. Uh, I thought you might say that. Uh, Benoit, do you, want to, do you want to tackle it? Because we do have another question from our audience for you as well. No, I, I, I think we are fully aligned with Antonio yeah. and Philippe on that question. Yes, I think so. Uh, so uh, Philippe Becquet is asking, Benoit, um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the KPIs and their use? I know you spoke uh, earlier on about them. Uh, if we speak, for example, of uh, of animal welfare, one of the uh, one of the key questions is what are the key, let's say, elements which uh, 
are able to measure animal welfare. In the past, uh, performance was a key driver of animal welfare. It is that the stress status is that uh, uh, the number of animals per uh, square meter. So we have plenty of elements to take into account in order to, to, to find the right KPIs. After that, in order to be able to communicate and to be aligned on communication on what we are doing, we need to have guidelines of what, what are the key KPIs uh, in order to uh, measure uh, animal welfare. I know that in our poultry group today we are working on 13 KPI on that topic so uh, and we will not use 13 but we want to make sure that at the end we have uh, a, a number of KPI which will be accepted by everybody in order to be able to to focus on that and to continue to work on that. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, just uh, just checking uh, again uh, what our questions are coming in. Um, well, I, I think possibly we, we've covered all of this uh, in, in some level already. But Hannah, uh, do you consider the animal nutritionists as an essential component uh, considering the EU One Health Network? Oh, I think that's a difficult one to answer, yeah. but May I may I just um, may I just tip in in the in the uh, debate about the waste that we just had because um, uh, I I think that we need to recognize that there is and that there will be a battle between climate and animal uh, health and animal welfare uh, and and we see that not only regarding feed but also at many other levels uh, here here in Denmark and I'm, I'm sure you 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 all do that uh, ar around in in the EU uh, so so I can easily understand what my colleagues say in the panel that they go don't go in that direction but then we need to to focus on the communication again because this is not an easy thing to communicate uh, so, so for, for me it's not just to say no to the to the use of, of waste, but but how to to balance it and how to uh, to make sure that that if we go in that direction, it's done in a way where we can both see ourselves in the climate and the animal health and welfare. And I know that's very difficult, but it's just something that I don't think uh, in the political environment uh, and in the consumer environment that we have at the moment, we, where we can just uh, Say say no categorically to to that, um, and then then I'm not sure how to answer your question, Jennifer. Uh, what what? Oh, well, I just wanted you to reflect really on on the the, the One Health uh, EU position um, and 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 how you're looking at it. Um, well, uh, I think it's it's well, of course, it's very important. Uh, and I think we, we cannot um, o overdo it. Uh, I think when, when you look at the, um, the healthcare costs that, that we have uh, concerning uh, the use of antibiotics and, and other things, uh, it, it, we, we, we have to look at everything in a One Health perspective. Uh, and, and if we haven't uh, been reminded before, we have been it during the last year with the COVID-19. So, um, so to us, uh, consumer health will always be the end goal of this, and and it starts in in the feed sector. So, so so to us, it's uh, to look ahead and to see does it does it uh, bring anything in the in the human health? Then then we will have to consider it in in that perspective. Uh, and everything we do about working with the reduction of antibiotics and and other things, we try to do it working together with the authorities on the human health side as well, uh, which is very important and which I'm sure that, that we can do more both in, uh, in Denmark but, but also in, in, the, uh, in the EU. So, so that's certainly some of the things that we will look more into the, the interdisciplinary uh, uh, cooperation in, in that matter. 
Thank you. And, and we've, we've almost almost at the end of our discussion and we've only for the first moment brought up COVID-19 and the, the, the necessary pressure on resilient food chains. Um, so let me, I want to sort of a, a final question to each of you, but feel free to sort of reflect on the overall discussion as well. Uh, Daniela, just uh, taking a step back from a global point of view, how do you think the EU is positioned in terms of progress on animal welfare, uh, in terms of resilience, as, as I mentioned, in terms of the, the extensive work on antimicrobial resistance. Um, give me a sort of an overview uh, on where you think the EU is ahead, behind, or could do better. Well, again, even though it's a bit difficult for me to take a position on one side, but I think it has also been said by other speakers uh, so far the the policies of the European Union towards animal welfare and also the containment of antimicrobial resistance have been a leading, uh, a, have shown the leading role for the European uh, Union. And that's that has been very much appreciated because in turn has uh, stimulated the, 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 the matters being tackled in so many other countries in the world. Uh, what is also very interesting that the EU has worked very much on international level. So not only looking at the EU countries, the member states, but also the so-called third countries through also capacity development activities, uh, a bilateral agreement and so on, and working with intergovernmental organizations like uh, FAO, for instance, but also many others. So I think that is uh, very much appreciated. And I think now having the EU recognizing the important role of animal nutrition to address animal health and welfare. And I would say, uh, given the, the debate and the comments that we have had, the One Health, uh, objective we all have. I think it's very much, uh, very, very important. And I will recall one of the previous questions, and I think having the animal nutrition sector being represented in the One Health uh, discussion, the One Health table would be very important and would be the only way not to overlook the importance and the role that animal nutrition can play in addressing One Health. Thank you very much. Um, Antonio, uh, to get your sort of wrap up thoughts, uh, are farmers sufficiently supported in their efforts to attain the targets that we've been talking about, um, you know, by member states, by the EU, by supply chain, by, by the sector in general? Look, as producers, we are never pleased with uh, the support. We, all, we always ask more and more support, of course. But uh, if you allowed me, in one minute, I will come back to something that the commissioner said. The commissioner spoke about deforestation, spoke about, okay, reducing the imports of soya uh, to avoid deforestation in, uh, in South uh, America. And like that, I want to, 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 let, to put you a question, and I would like to put that question to the commissioner. Of course, it's not possible. But how can we explain that in 2000, we have banned the use of uh, protected pro animal proteins, PAPs, as we call PAPs. Uh, we have banned that due to the BSE in the cows. Uh, since 2005, we have a lot of scientific opinions from EFSA that there is no problems on pigs and poultry to use this product. And until now, we have a lot of scientific opinions and we don't have the authorization uh, to, uh, to use this kind of products. And now we speak about deforestation, but we have a protein here that we cannot use and could reduce the, the, the imports of, uh, of soya and so contribute to the more sustainability of our production. But of course, uh, came back to your question. Of course, we are we are asking uh, always more and more. But I think in the reasonable uh, situation, because for instance now we have a project uh, that we are going to discuss with the Commission to improve animal welfare. Uh, but of course, we 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 need some help. To, to make the, the necessary investments to improve the animal world. Thank you.
No. Thank you, Antonio. We're not going to be able to answer all your questions in an hour and a half in this <laughs> forum this morning. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Philip. Um, as, a, as a wrap up question to you, I would kind of like you to reflect on the the, uh, there's something that you raised about animal performance at the very beginning, but I want to talk about the adequate nutrition um, and, you know, about the aspiration to go beyond just basic nutritional requirements. Uh, where are we at and, and, and you know, what, what sort of debate would you like to see in the future? Yeah, adequate nutrition, of course, it's all about definitions and sometimes it's not easy to even define that, but adequate nutrition would be a nutrition that really meets the demands of the, the animal, of course, without, um, let's say, well, and making sure that the animal um, stays healthy. So it's also about uh, preventing issues in the animal in terms of health or gut health or whatever. So I think this is really important, as well as considering the fact that we are very, well, we are dealing often, uh, for example, with, 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 with uh, high-performing animals. And if you look at the broiler chicken that grows very fast in five weeks, so high-performing animals, which means that there's a very, very delicate balance there, okay? If you, um, if the animals have a little bit too much of, of, of energy or, or, or amino acids or protein in the gut, it could yield a, 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 a dysbiosis or bacterial overgrowth, and that would cause disease on itself. So it's a very delicate balance there between, between um, animal nutrition and health. Uh, so maybe for the future also, um, we need to think a little bit more about, well, other, maybe more, well, uh, innovative types of feeding. I was thinking about um, um, recent studies in, in, in other continents as well, in which they were uh, focusing on precision feeding. So really daily adaptation of, of, of the, the energy requirements for the animals. And I was basically talking about broiler chickens in this case, which could mean, for example, that you will have much more balanced, adequate nutrition for these animals that is not causing the same problems than what we have sometimes today. Because if you you can't explain to, to people that do not know what animal protection uh, really is that, that, that in a lot of places it's very difficult to keep animals for five weeks, for example, without using uh, antimicrobials. It's something very difficult to explain and this is something we need to do in the future definitely. And what I maybe want to say here also is that Benoit said that in the last 10 years we have 35% of less antimicrobials and even if you look at the in-feed antimicrobials it's 51%. This is a very clear communication, I think, and I didn't see that coming up in any news items, for example. So I think this is something that really we should do and, and, and also explain that this is because of the, the interaction between, between science, between, between the companies, between, between regulation and et cetera. So this is something that is, I think, a very strong and clear communication for the future, these kind of things. Thank you, uh, Philip. And there was a question, I should say, in our chat that was asking, uh, can Philip give a short overview of, of all the feed products in the market today, which I think is like asking you for a lecture, which is, uh, but perhaps if, so. you, uh, <laughs> if, but if, uh, if we can share online after the fact using the hashtag, maybe you can direct people to some useful websites. I know there's been a lot of requests for, for just very specialist knowledge today. Benoit, let me turn to you and just ask you as a kind of wrap up uh, where you would like to see the debate go um, at EU level or at national level or, or even global level in terms of the sector? What are your expectations as well as your hopes? My, my, my expectation is, uh, it's a bit of a large comment, but uh, going to the system of penalty, from a system of penalty to a system of bonus. Okay, so we, we have a lot of, of system. You are not applying that and then you will have a penalty. If we could have a system of bonus, which pushes all the industry to go and uh, all the supply chain to go in the, in, in the, in the right direction, I, I, I think that's a key message. So second message is, I, I think that innovation will continue to help a lot. Uh, Philip was speaking about adequate nutrition. Uh, it's uh, it's no more a dream in dairy cows. In dairy cows, uh, if a cow is milk uh, with a robot, you have on day-to-day -day basis the milk fat composition. Uh, as a consequence, also you can have a camera uh, filming the cow, and you are able to see if she starts not to eat enough. And by that. On those two criteria, you are able to say to the farmer, ah, you have an alert, this cow has, your cow has probably an acidosis, and 
immediately after a few hours you are able to recalculate the diet and to provide a new diet which will help to solve that issue so that's uh, that's real life uh, and we will do more and more that in uh, in poultry in swine in aqua for sure but that's something which is in place and con continuing in innovation will help to solve uh, the key question we were having today especially on the uh, on, uh, antibiotic use and, and things like that Thank you very much, Benoit, for, for introducing that thought. Uh, Hannah, we've just a couple of minutes left, but I will, I will give the final words to you. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, it's, it's just that I, I would like to highlight again the, the, the reduction. In the, and if there was a wish for me, it was that reduction of antibiotics. Uh, as I said, that we have, we have a lot of tools, but some of the tools, they are out. They are... Also, they've been in play for many years. So, so if I, I could have feet playing a leading role in the reduction of antibiotics, it would be something worth remembering and something that I would really wish for. I know they're doing a lot of uh, things already, but, but, but then I would say keep on doing it. And then also uh, I would like to highlight the cooperation that we have all talked about between research uh, authorities and so on. And, and we are, as an authority, happy to play our part uh, in that role. So I think it's just a matter of, of we all walk the talk now uh, about the innovation, about the um, development, uh, and then uh, set us, uh, us together and, and uh, work together in, in uniting our resources in, in the renewal of the legislation, but also renewing the uh, the feed additives and so on, because the common goals, they are there. And I think that if my final words should be that the consumers, they expect it from us. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. If I may paraphrase, keep up the good work and keep innovating, I suppose might be a way to sum up. Uh, thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your very, very interesting discussion today. Thank you to our audience. We had more than 300 people tuning in and sending in their questions. I know we didn't get the chance to answer all of them, but uh, we will do our best to keep the conversation going online. You can follow the hashtag EA Debates to keep an eye on future your active discussions. Thank you again to our supporters today, Fefak and Fefana, and have a lovely Wednesday. <laughs>